Hello! In this video, I'm going to explain how the RSA crypto system works from a theoretical point of view. There are a couple of important theorems that provide the core background for how this process works. Most people in the real world applying RSA don't ever have to think about the Chinese remainder theorem or Fermat's little theorem because it really is in the background. But for those of us who have an interest in understanding how the process works from a theoretical perspective, might benefit from this quick little overview that I'm about to provide. When you're working with the RSA crypto system, you always have to start off with two large prime numbers. I'm going to call them P and Q. Let's let P and Q be two large prime numbers. And these are generally kept secret. These are private values. It's part of uh, the data that you need in order to perform RSA cryptography are these primes P and Q. And then what we do is we let N be equal to P times Q. And this value is publicly announced. And anybody who would like to send this individual who has publicly given out the value of n may do so. The way that this is done, in other words, the encryption process, the encryption process is done by taking some numerical equivalent of your message, I'll call it capital M, and raising it to what is often referred to as an encryption exponent E, and I should also mention that E is also a public value. Everybody knows uh, the value of not only N, but also E. And what we do is we reduce this in mod N to some value C. And C is the ciphertext, the coded version of the original message M. Now, the decryption process is something that only the person with the private keys P and Q is able to do and that's because it requires it requires a person to raise the ciphertext to another power which I'm going to call D and once that gets reduced the result will be the original message M when I reduce it in mod N again but what is D? And how is D related to E? It turns out that E times D, they have to cancel each other out. Encryption and decryption have to sort of undo each other. But this is not in mod N. This is actually in modulo P minus 1 times Q minus 1. Only the person who knows what P and Q are will be able to have the right modulus down here in order to solve for D. So we're going to solve for D. We can only do that if we know what P and Q are. And by the way, um, you can see that the, the E would be given in advance, but it needs to be relatively prime to P minus 1 times Q minus 1. In other words, in order for E to have a multiplicative inverse, we have to be able to, to choose E so that it is relatively prime to P minus 1 times Q minus 1. All of that can be, can be certainly arranged. So now I would like to show you why it is that with this information as a setup, that we actually uh, decrypt messages correctly when we raise the ciphertext to the D power. So what we've already said is that you know, M to the E is C, and C to the D is M. So let's actually put these two things together. If I look at M to the E D, right, this is really C to the D, and I'm claiming, I'm claiming here that that is actually congruent to M again in mod N. Why is this true? Well, the point is that since ED is congruent to 1, 
modulo p minus 1 times q minus 1. That actually means that uh, ed can be written as one more than some multiple, I'll call it k, of the product p minus 1 times q minus 1. This is for some integer k. So ed can be written in that form. So when I now calculate m to the ed, I would like to understand why does that give me m again? Why does that get me back to the original message? Well, I'm going to actually first calculate this in mod p and in mod q separately. So I'm going to go ahead and feed in what e times d is equal to. And let me give myself a little bit more room. You can always pause and rewind this uh, video if you need to. But in the meantime, we've got a moment now to look things over. So I can rewrite this as m times m to the p minus 1 raised to the k times q minus 1. And if I look at that in mod p, remember that we have Fermat's little theorem. And in Fermat, Fermat's little theorem tells me that when I raise a number to the p minus 1 power in mod p, if I work in mod p, that that will become a 1. So I can ignore it, and I actually conclude that, e, that m to the ed is congruent to m in mod p. This is by Fermat's little theorem. Right? On the other hand, I can do the same exact calculation over here. I can set up exactly the same way, except I can do it this time in mod q. And in so doing, I'm going to actually isolate m to the q minus 1 power times k to the p minus 1. And in mod q, well, again, this reduces to m by Fermat's little theorem. So I actually now know, thus, m to the ed satisfies the following system. x is congruent to m mod p, and x is congruent to m mod q. We have found a solution to this system of congruences. And now we can actually invoke the uniqueness part of the Chinese remainder theorem because we can also note that M itself satisfies the same congruence, the same system of congruences here. We have found two solutions to the same system of congruences. And the Chinese remainder theorem says that, well, if you have a system of congruences where the moduli are pairwise relatively prime, that those solutions, are they are always unique modulo the product of the primes. In other words, m to the ed is congruent to m modulo little n. And that's really what I was claiming up here. That if I take my message, I raise it to the e power first, and then raise that to the d power, that I get back to m again. This is showing the reason that that works from a mathematical point of view. We use the Chinese remainder theorem to get, well, specifically the uniqueness part of the Chinese remainder theorem. However, first we have to calculate in mod p and in mod q individually that m to the ed reduces to m. And that uses Fermat's little theorem. It is a wonderful combination of two of the most important theorems in number theory. RSA works 
because of that joint usage of Fermat's Little Theorem and the Chinese Remainder Theorem. I hope this little background explanation makes sense. I invite questions if there are any, and I look forward to seeing you all again soon in the next video. Thank you.